Now if we just add a little more of that Dewalt yellow, we'll have ourselves a happy little logo right there. I can't keep doing this stupid voices too much. <laughs> if you can't beat the memes, join them. How is it going everyone? My name is Eric and welcome to Out of the Groove Halloween episode! People on this channel always say I look like Bob Ross. I figured I'd cater to them a little bit this week, uh, but it's yeah, it's the Halloween episode. And uh, we got some uh, spooky stuff to talk about. Not really actually, we mostly have some pretty chill things to talk about. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Martinsville finish especially. We're going to talk about Jimmy Johnson's new sponsor uh, and then a little bit of a Texas Motor Speedway preview, which could be interesting. But in the meantime, I'm going to put some of this stuff off to the side. I need to put my glasses back on. Oh wow, I really look stupid, don't I? I literally threw this costume together in like 30 seconds. I was like, what am I gonna be for the Halloween episode? Oh my gosh, I have this shirt, let's, yeah. Anyway, that's how it basically came together. Let's talk about NASCAR. I'm gonna start by talking about the news that came out Sunday morning before the Cup Series race actually started. Less than an hour before the race even started, Hendrick Motorsports, out of nowhere, announced that Jimmy Johnson's new sponsor for the 2019 season would be Ally Financial. This comes after months of speculation after Lowe's announced that they would be stepping away from the sport at the end of this year. There were some rumors for a while that thought Jimmy Johnson might even retire early, uh, but obviously those are now untrue. Ally Financial has come on not just to sponsor, you know, part of Jimmy's schedule, next year. They will be the full-time primary sponsor on that 48 car for the next two full Cup Series seasons. And that's really the one important takeaway from this announcement. I mean, it kind of came out of nowhere. They didn't even show us a paint scheme yet, so we don't even know what the car is going to look like. Probably going to be purple. But the important thing about this sort of surprise announcement, you know, it, it was shocking that it came out right before a race, but you know, uh, uh, Rick Hendrick did say about a month ago that he we were going to have an announcement by the end of October, so I guess we should have remembered that. Anyway, but yeah, the fact that it's a two-year deal and they're sponsoring every race. That means they're going to be the primary sponsor for 72 races over the next two years, at least. This is a great announcement for the NASCAR as a sport, as a company. I know most people, myself included, did not expect Jimmy Johnson to be able to find a full-time sponsor to replace Lowe's. You know, Lowe's has sponsored basically every single one of his races for like 18 years. Over the years, as the business model and the sport has kind of changed a little bit, we really don't see hardly any drivers sponsored by one company for 36 races. I think Denny Hamlin with FedEx is the only other driver like that, whereas back in the day, you had Tony Stewart with Home Depot, Dale Jr. with Budweiser, and so on. So with all that in mind, I know I did not expect Jimmy Johnson and that 48 team to find a full-time sponsor like this. But the fact that they did, the fact that they found a company that's willing to invest this much money into NASCAR is only a good thing for the sport. It's really great. I'm actually really excited to see what the car looks like. A lot of Jimmy Johnson fans wanted it to be blue or yellow or something like that, but I'm actually really excited to see what a purple car looks like. Matt Kenseth's old Crown Royal purple cars are some of my favorites. Bubba Wallace's click and close car this year is one of my favorites. I really like purple cars, so I'm excited to see it at least. That's all I really wanted to say there. I want to briefly touch again on the Logano Truex finish at Martinsville. It's still being debated, you know, a few days later. I want to just give my final thoughts on the you know final few laps, specifically the last lap of the race, whether it was a dirty move by Logano, whether it was all fair by Logano, whether Truex had a right to be angry. I just want to give you my final thoughts, and they haven't really changed much since Sunday afternoon. But I've seen a lot of interesting back and forth on social media. I've gotten involved too, and I think we've had some pretty interesting debates, and I really think it's interesting how, as with many issues, the NASCAR fan base is pretty much split 50-50 in terms of what they consider good racing or clean racing or fair racing. I gave you guys my stance on Sunday after the race. You know, I'm more on Truex's side than Logano because, you know, while I don't think Logano made an overly dirty move, it was an unnecessary move, you know? I get that the bump and run is pretty much fair game at Martinsville, historically, and it always has been. I usually don't really have that big of a problem with it. The only reason I have any issue with it at all in this case is because it was really unnecessary. I mean, Martin Truex Jr. battled Joey Logano perfectly cleanly for the better part of 10 laps. Two of them, most of that was spent side by side. Neither driver was running into the other much at all. There was really no, no back and forth, no contact. It was pretty clean. Joey Logano was clearly the worst car car at that point. Truex was clearly the better car, and once Truex completed that pass, I figured the race was over. Joey Logano choosing to bump Truex going into the very next turn and moving him out of the groove and then ultimately beating him to the finish line, I was a little surprised to see it. I don't have a problem with the bump and run when the car that's doing the bumping is the faster car. Like if you're like catching someone late in the race, catching someone late in the race to the last lap and you give the guy a nudge, I don't mind it at all. But when you're the slower car, which Joey Logano was in that case, Truex beat him fair and square over the last 10 laps. He ran him down and passed him cleanly. At that point, the fact that you just immediately sailed it off into the next corner and bumped him out of the way to win, it just feels like a cheap shot, just a little bit. I'm not gonna completely fault Logano, and I said this on Sunday, I don't think he's like, I don't think we should be angry at Logano. I think it was somewhat fair because it's Martinsville, but I didn't like it. 
And that's, that's basically my stance. I know you guys can disagree with me. All you old timers, the people like to shout at me like, oh, Dale Sen Senior used to do the same thing. I've said this before. If I'd been a fan in the 90s, I probably wouldn't have been a fan of Dale Senior. I get that he's a great driver. He's been responsible for many of the most historic and memorable moments in the sports history, but I probably wouldn't have appreciated many of them at the time. He was the intimidator. He didn't make people feel all warm and fuzzy whenever he came to the lead. No, he scared people. He angered people. He frustrated people. And that's why a lot of people liked him. And that's why a lot of people didn't like him. I don't have a big problem with Joey Logano bumping Truex out of the way. It was, you know, a clean bump and run at least. My only criticism is that there are a lot of fans I feel like that are kind of applauding Logano and saying that he had every right to do that. And I, I, I didn't see it that way. Drivers always say, I, you know, I race people how they race me. Well, Mark Truex Jr. raced Logano very respectfully and very cleanly and Logano did not return the favor. So he kind of went against the driver code from what I've heard. That's why I side with Truex mostly on this issue. At the end of the day, this was a great finish and I loved every minute of it. I think it was great for the sport and that's kind of what I talk, what I want to talk about in a minute. Before I do that though, I want to address what are the possibilities of future payback for Martin Truex Jr. Is Truex going to do something to Logano? You know, he made his post-race comments like, oh, he's not going to win the championship after that move. Well, why is he not going to win the championship? Because I'm going to beat him. But there's a hesitation before he said that. Like he was thinking like, mm, maybe I'll wreck him, maybe I'll wreck him. No, I'm just going to beat him. So will Martin Truex Jr. pull a Matt Kenseth and just take him out one of these next few races? I don't think so. As dramatic and flashy as it may be, uh, Martin Truex Jr. is not that kind of guy. Dale Jr. said during the broadcast, he's too nice of a driver. That's part of why he's getting pushed around by some of these guys. Martin Truex Jr. is not going to wreck Joey Logano on purpose like that. I would be shocked. I mean, you look ahead at the, the tracks we have coming up. You got Texas next week's a high banked, fast mile and a half. You know, Truex is a smart guy. He's not going to take him out there. Kyle Busch got suspended when he took a guy out there. You go to Phoenix or ISM, whatever it's called. You know, the, the problem is these next two races, it's not going to really affect Logano whether or not he wrecks. Logano Logano's already locked into Homestead. These next two races don't matter for him. The only race that left this year that matters for Logano, where Truex could really hit him where it hurts, is the championship race at Homestead. And assuming Martin Truex Jr. makes it into that race, which it looks like there's a decent chance he could, I don't really see Truex putting his championship on the line just to get some petty retaliation for Joey, at Joey Logano. Like I said, what Joey Logano did to Truex wasn't even that bad. It was a bump and run. It's not like what Hamlin did to Elliott last year where he just straight up wrecked him. That's not what Logano did. And that's why I think Martin Truex Jr., you know, he's mad, upset about it in the moment, but when he stops and thinks about it, he's not going to overreact to this issue. It wasn't that big of a, wasn't that big of an event. The only way I see any retaliation is if the two of them are running first and second with five laps to go in the championship race, then yes, Truex might get into the back of Logano. That's the only way anything happens. I don't see any other retaliation, at least not this year. If things don't work out for Truex and he misses, doesn't make it to the Final Four, come next year, we could see something one of the first few weeks. Now this is where I want to transition to my final point on this whole topic and then we can put it away, is that this finish, no matter whose side you're on, was great for NASCAR and it proves why we need more short tracks on the schedule. The fact that we're still talking about this and debating it back and forth on social media, you know, several days later, and we probably still will a week from now, is amazing. That's what NASCAR needs. They need this dialogue. It's not a bad thing that fans are criticizing or opposing each other in this case. This is a case where I think the fact that NASCAR fans are pretty much split 50-50 is actually a good thing for the sport. You know, it creates a dialogue, creates a conversation, it creates a debate. And if there's one thing that people like to do in this country, it's throw their opinions back and forth. And that's what finishes like this allows. Short tracks like Martinsville are historically known for creating creating more finishes like this, more drama like this, and that's why we need more of them on the schedule. And I know we're not going to get any schedule changes until 2020, 2021, around that time, uh, but I think NASCAR is definitely going to look at races like what we saw here at Martinsville when they're making those decisions. There's always there's already rumors and reports that they might bring back some old short track. Whether or not that happens remains to be seen, but I think NASCAR definitely sees the excitement that short tracks produce. And now I know I get a lot of flack for defending NASCAR or for believing in the NASCAR sanctioning body, but I'm gonna believe in them here and I'm gonna hope that they do the right thing and at least add one or two new short tracks to the schedule in a couple years. At least I hope they will. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about briefly is Texas Motor Speedway this weekend. If you saw my video earlier this week, I will be there in person at the Texas Motor Speedway watching them cars. I'll be filming and making a video about it. Uh, so yeah, stay tuned for that next week. But in this video, I'm gonna give you my pick to win. I'm gonna tell you who to watch out for because uh, this race, while it seems like it's just your standard mile and a half, uh, you know, we've seen some of the mile and a halfs in this round produce some of the best drama. Look at Las Vegas, even look at Kansas wasn't too bad. If we briefly look at the playoff grid right now, you see several names already almost in must-win scenarios. Kurt Busch, 
Chase Elliott, Clint Boyer, Eric Amarola, they need to look at this Texas date as a big one. Unfortunately, those four guys I just named have not had significant success at this track in their history. The most notable guy of those four is probably Kurt Busch, who has won the pole in the last two Texas Motor Speedway races. So clearly that team knows how to get some speed at this track, but they're going to have to figure out how to put a full race together for 500 miles, and they're going to need to do it this weekend, probably. Chase Elliott's the guy to watch. He's the guy most people had moving on to the Final Four because they ran so well in this last round. He won the race at Kansas, which is a mile and a half, so keep an eye on Chase Elliott to run top five and maybe make a big statement and win this weekend. But my pick is not going to be one of those four. It's going to be one of the guys above this cut line already, and it's not the guy who just won at Martinsville, or even the guy he bumped out of the way to do it. My pick for this weekend is Kyle Busch. I know, kind of boring. Kyle Busch has three career wins at Texas, although all three of them have come in the spring race. This is the fall race, so you know maybe there's a reason to be skeptical there. He did win this race just this last spring, back in April. But the reason I'm picking him is more to do with his mile and a half success this year. He's been the best on mile and a halfs in 2018. It's between him and Hart but Kyle Busch, if you look at his last five mile and a half finishes, he has two wins. All five of those races are top tens. He was second just a couple weeks ago at Kansas, seventh back at Las Vegas. Uh, he was second at Kentucky, and then he has wins at Chicagoland and Charlotte. So Kyle Busch has been great at mile and a half, even recently. His last win was Richmond, which is a short track, but uh, Kyle Busch did run really well at Martinsville, finished fourth there. He's been on the up and up. Uh, of the quote-unquote big three drivers, he's got the best history at Texas Motor Speedway. Watch out for Harvick. Obviously, he won this race at Texas one year ago, so keep an eye on Harvick. Uh, but my pick this weekend is Kyle Busch in that 18 car. Uh, I think he gets it done. I think he locks himself in early. Anyway, you guys, that is my show. Going to try and keep it pretty short and sweet. You know, it's Halloween. People got places to be, things to do. Not me, of course. Let me know what you guys think about uh, what I talked about in this episode. If you agree, disagree, uh, let me know down in the comments. You can follow me on Twitter. You can follow me on Instagram. Or you can become a sponsor of the show. For just $5 a month, uh, you can have your name featured on every single episode and access to Afterthoughts, uh, the behind-the-scenes uh, kind of mini podcast series that is also exclusive to Patreon. So thank you all for the support, and I uh, appreciate it so much. Since I'll be at the race Sunday, I'm not sure that I'll have an episode up that night. It probably won't be up until Monday afternoon, so... Sorry about that, but I will have another video up later in the week that basically will be a vlog style video of my entire experience at the track. So hopefully that will make up for it. Bonus video next week. But yeah, that's all I got. Happy Halloween, everyone. Uh, stay safe out there. We don't want any happy little accidents now, do we? <laughs> oh, this, this is so bad. <laughs>